All right, good evening and welcome to Bibliology and Bible Overview, BI 101, uh, brought to you by New Covenant College and taught here at the Institute out of the New Testament Baptist Church in Dover, Tennessee. Uh, we are approaching week nine this evening in this course, and I want to thank all of you students who have faithfully attended this class and who have stuck it out thus far uh, as we are uh, marching right along. This is a two-hour class, 20-week class, and we're coming now to week number nine. Last time uh, we met together, we discussed the modern textual uh, criticism and the critical text of the Greek New Testament. And we talked about how the modern uh, Greek text, the critical text, contradicts several principles of believing bibliology and that consistently applying the principles of providential preservation would never lead one to the critical text. Providential preservation leads one to the text of Scripture that God's people have always handled, have always had, have always accessed, because that is the text providentially that God's people have had for them uh, to use, to formulate doctrine, to guide their teaching, to guide what they have done in the church down through the ages. God's Word has been manifested to God's people. And so tonight, week number nine, I said last week we were going to look at two different views that uh, opposed uh, what we might call the believing bibliology, the system of believing bibliology, or the doctrine of providential preservation. And the first of, of those views was the view of the critical position, the modern textual criticism position. But tonight, we're going to flip on the opposite end of the spectrum, and we're going to look at a very uh, uh, exciting, controversial, fun, but yet very relevant and very dangerous position of Ruckmanism. Ruckmanism. And um, this is a view that uh, I believe really doesn't get due attention in the textual debate. Uh, a lot of people just throw this view out in, in right field somewhere and don't pay any attention to it. A lot of people focus so much on the modern textual critic position that they kind of turn a blind eye to Ruckmanism, and um, especially in the South, which is where I happen to minister and live, uh, there, Ruckmanism is still a relevant issue. Uh, so I believe that it really demands our attention this evening. And uh, so let's first just define it. What is Ruckmanism? What is Ruckmanism? Well, Ruckmanism is a system of doctrines devised and taught by a man named Peter Ruckman. Peter Ruckman. So Ruckmanism comes from... Peter Ruckman. And Mr. Ruckman was a teacher and pastor. Uh, he pastored Bible Baptist Church in Pensacola, Florida. And in 1965, he founded the Pensacola Bible Institute. And um, Ruck, Ruckman was involved in the broader stream of the fundamentalist movement, uh, was a self-professed independent fundamental Baptist. And uh, he was known for a number of controversial teachings. He was known for uh, his rhetoric. But arguably, the thing that he is most remembered for is what he taught concerning bibliology. He held to a, a very distinct, uh, a very... Uh, uh, emphatic position on the text, and those who adhere to these teachings are referred to as Ruckmanites. Ruckmanites. Um, there are those who uh, disregard that and say that that's a, a pejorative term, but I've ran across several that will say, yes, I am a Ruckmanite. I follow the teachings of Peter Ruckman. I believe he was right on this issue, and so I don't think it's unfair to, to use that terminology. Uh, and those who adhere to his teachings of Ruckmanism, primarily when one says they are a Ruckmanite, what they are most often referring to is what he taught concerning the text. And even the very term Ruckmanism, though it can be used to refer to what Ruckman might have taught in some other areas, it primarily refers to what he taught concerning the text. And this is going to be our uh, scope of discussion tonight. So 
Anytime I use the, the term Ruckmanism or Ruckmanite, I, I'm referring exclusively to the position on the text of the New Testament. Though if you study Ruckmanism and you're reading about it in some other theological areas, in some other doctrinal topics, you might find that the same terms used to describe other teachings of Ruckman in other areas. But for tonight, uh, in this class, we're covering the doctrine of bibliology. So the question comes, why devote a whole class to this issue? Why spend so much time talking about this? Well, there's several reasons. Um, the number one reason is, is that it just hasn't really been addressed. Uh, it's it's kind of hard to find a, a wealth of information on this topic. There's not a lot of guys that are writing about it or speaking about it. It's hard to find lectures and classes about this topic. I had to do a lot of just uh, primary source reading for this, reading Ruckman and reading Ruckmanites. And there's not really a whole lot of men that have written in, uh, in, in this area. Uh, there's a lot of guys that have put out material covering modern textual criticism and the critical text, but not so much so on the Ruckman issue. So that's one reason. The, the other reason is really the deceitfulness of the position. The deceitfulness of the position. What do I mean by that? Well, at first glance, it, it, it appears as if Ruckmanism has a lot in common with believing bibliology and a received text position, which is what we have been teaching in this class. Um, let me just let the cat out of the bag. Ruckmanism takes a, a very hardcore King James only position. Now, we don't take a hardcore King James only position. We hold to a received text position. Uh, but when it comes to what we use for the English scriptures, we would say that the, that the King James Bible is, a, is a, a wonderful, magnificent translation of the received text and ought be, to be used. Um, but Ruckman goes uh, many steps further and takes a very hardcore King James only position. And it is true that he rejects the critical text. It's true that he rejects uh, modern textual criticism. Uh, but let me, let me be so emphatically clear about this. There is absolutely nothing in common whatsoever with the foundations of Ruckmanism and the foundations of believing bibliology. Okay? And, and we'll see that as we go along. Uh, like I said, yes, Ruckman rejects the critical text, but guess what? He also rejects the received text as well. He rejects the Textus Receptus as well. We'll get into all of that. But um, yeah, those of us who advocate a received text position are, are often accused uh, of falling into the Ruckman camp. And I just want to say up front, there's nothing in common with what we've been presenting thus far in this class and the teachings known as Ruckmanism. Nothing whatsoever. So the deceitfulness of it is one reason. It sounds uh, like it, it might be a good position because, yes, it rejects the critical text and, uh, and so on and so forth, but uh, it, it's, it's deceiving in that way because there's nothing good about this position, as we'll see. Uh, secondly, or thirdly, the popularity of Ruckmanism demands that we talk about this issue and we deal with this issue in light of what the Bible teaches concerning bibliology. Um, Peter Ruckman, as I said, professed himself to be a Baptist, and many in the fundamentalist movement of the 1900s adopted a uh, Ruckmanite position of the Bible. Ruckman's teachings, arguably more so than any other King James onlyist of his variety, um, have influenced so-called Baptist churches more than just about any other teacher. And uh, whether they know it or not, uh, they, they, a lot of churches have been influenced by Ruckman, and there are many churches today who even still hold to a full-throttle Ruckmanite position, and they, they write prolifically, and they uh, produce videos and content and articles. Uh, some teachers come to mind just off the top of my head when I think about this of guys today that, uh, that would even, you know, so much as... Uh, put Ruckman right up on the wall behind them as they're giving their presentations. So to say that, uh, well, nobody believes that, nobody really holds to that is not true. There's many people uh, in 2021 that are still believing these teachings. And then uh, the lastly, the reason why we want to devote a class on this is what I've, I've deemed Ruckmanite or Ruckmanism light, uh, a kind of a quasi-Ruckmanism. Well, what do I mean by this? Well, uh, it's a position that's, that's very popular amongst independent Baptists today, and even a lot of sovereign grace independent Baptists. And thankfully, 
this group rejects some of the more radical aspects of Ruckmanism. Okay, so uh, when we start talking about the differences, you'll understand what I mean. And thankfully, they, they reject some of these radical aspects. But whether they realize it or not, they accept some of the Ruckmanite presuppositions. Whether they realize it or not, um, oftentimes when discussing with, with individuals that hold a, a semi-somewhat of this position, they'll say, well, I don't, I don't know anything about Ruckman. I've never read any of Ruckman. Well, the fact of the matter is it doesn't, it doesn't really matter if you've read him or if you know about him because his teachings were so popular in the 60s and 70s and 80s and have spread throughout, especially here in the South, but really all over and, and uh, have infiltrated their way into so many different churches. You don't necessarily have to have read Ruckman to have um, come to believe some of his presuppositions and some of the principles that he taught. And... Um, this position, this Ruckmanite light position, again, it, it thinks that it's making a valiant defense of the Bible and of what the Bible teaches concerning bibliology, but it has a fundamentally flawed foundation. Fundamentally flawed foundation. And so uh, this is why uh, we are talking about Ruckmanism uh, here in week number nine of this class. Now, let me give you three disclaimers before we get into the meat and potatoes of this lecture tonight. Uh, I feel like these are necessary uh, in a class like this. So first, let me just state, lest uh, my words be twisted later, we are not discussing any other uh, of Ruckman's teachings besides bibliology. Okay, so we're not talking about his, his view of, the, of dispensationalism or dispensational salvation or anything like that. Uh, and we're also not talking about his demeanor or his rhetoric or his language. If you've read anything from Ruckman, you'll know what I'm referring to. We're not getting into any of that. We're going to exclusively focus on the issues. And uh, when I say that, let me also give you the second disclaimer, and that is this. I'm going to share with you some quotes from Ruckman, and uh, some of them are a bit incendiary. And I want to apologize up front for the language and the demeanor, but I do think it's important that you hear these primary sources, just like we quoted um, primary sources in some of these other lectures so that we can understand what we're talking about. We do not want to bear false witness. And so um, I will share some quotes with you, but I, let me just warn you right now, <laughs> uh, some of this language is a bit incendiary. Uh, thirdly, I want to say this, not all King James onlyists or those that prefer the King James are uh, Ruckmanites. Not, uh, so I'm not painting with a broad brush tonight. I'm not saying, well, anybody who's, who claims to be a King James onlyist is a Ruckmanite. I'm, that's not what I'm saying. Um, if you haven't figured out by now, uh, the, the position that, that has been taught, believing bibliology, has brought us to the logical conclusion of the received text and once you get to the logical conclusion of the received text, you understand that in the English language, the, uh, one of the best, if not the best, translation of the received text is the King James Version of the Bible. And it's the version that, that we've used in the teaching of this class. And we certainly do not hold to any type of a Ruckmanite position. So not uh, all that hold to a Ruckmanite position, or all that hold to a King James preferred position are Ruckmanites in any sense of the word. Um, so that is uh, just some disclaimers that I feel the need to emphatically state up front before we get into this class. So now that that is said, um, let's talk a little bit about some of the specific teachings of Ruckmanism. Now, Ruckmanism and preservation. Ruckmanism and preservation. What does Ruckmanism teach concerning the preservation of God's Word? Well, first... Let's recap on what we've learned thus far in this class. What have we learned? Well, we've learned that God has promised to providentially preserve His Word in every age. We've learned that there has never been a time when God's people did not possess the infallible Word of God. The Word of God is perpetually manifested to God's people. We've learned that the original text is our ultimate authority because God has kept the word pure in the original languages. And the only reason that can be 
that the original text is our authority is because we possess the original text today. So we're not as those who say, well, the originals are our authority, but we don't know what the originals say. No, the originals are our authority, and we possess the originals. And we believe that many faithful translations have been produced in a variety of languages from the original text. God has kept his word pure. Every word that God inspired, he has preserved, right? So that's what the Bible teaches concerning preservation. Well, what does Ruckmanism teach concerning preservation? Well, fundamentally, the Ruckmanite position denies providential preservation. It denies providential preservation. That is, it does not teach that God has preserved his word in the original languages in every age. It admits, it confesses, that there have been periods of time when the perfectly preserved word of God was not accessible to the people of God and, it, and worse, was not even in existence on earth. Okay? There were, there were periods of time when the word of God was lost. And if you have, I don't care if it is for two and a half hours, if you have a period of time in which God's word was lost from the earth, you are categorically denying providential preservation. The originals are our authority. Therefore, if we lose the originals, we have no authority from which to reconstruct the text or which to re, uh, regain the text. If you lose the text, it's lost. That's the problem with reconstructing the text. That's the problem with a view that teaches that uh, preservation was fulfilled at some point in history uh, 100 years, 200 years, or 1,000 years after those originals were written, right? And Ruckmanism denies providential preservation. Ruckmanism teaches that the originals were completely lost as early as the 4th century and that the preserved Word of God did not exist on earth for over 1,000 years. And we'll get into what happened after those 1,000 years, but let me give you a quote from Peter Ruckman, uh, this was in his book, The Last Grenade. Peter Ruckman says this, and bear with me. He says, there's no such animal as the Greek New Testament that can be found anywhere since Constantine died. On page 49, and then on page 116, he says, there is no the Greek text. So what is he saying there? He's saying uh, that... Uh, when the emperor Constantine died, now Constantine ruled in Constantinople uh, in the 300s, so in the early 4th century, he said when Constantine died, that's the last time we had the originals. There's no originals and there's no Greek text. God did not preserve those originals. Okay, that's his position. And uh, anyone that, that says that we have the originals or that the Greek has been preserved would uh, fall out of line with Ruckman's teachings. Ruckman says this in the same book, in The Last Grenade, he says this, the Greek, the Greek uh, is a satanic expedient used by all professional liars to intimate that they have the original text when they do not. So if you claim to possess the Greek text, according to Ruckman, you are a satanic liar. Well, let me, let me tell you a satanic lie tonight. We have the, the Greek text. We have God's Word. It's right here in my hand, the received text of the New Testament. This is what God inspired uh, 2,000, going on 2,000 years ago. This is what God inspired. This is what God has preserved. And uh, every word in this book, this is Scrivener's edition of the received text, every word in this book is the inspired Word of God preserved perfectly for us today. Uh, we've always possessed this text. We've always possessed that text. That text was not an innovation that came about in the 1500s. I'm not going to repeat that lecture. Several weeks ago, we covered the received text, but you'll remember that it, uh, the, the editors of the received text did not come together and write in and fill in the blanks. No, they just took manuscripts that contained all of these readings and compiled them into a printed codex. A printed book, right? So, uh, according to Ruckman, though, that's a satanic lie. He would say that uh, this, and, and we're, we'll see where he explicitly says that, where this text is filled with errors and, and is not the preserved Word of God and therefore not the authority, okay? So, Peter Ruckman denying providential preservation, denying that God keeps the, the Word pure in the language in which he gave it, Hopefully, 
if you've paid attention in this class, some logical questions are coming into your mind. Uh, perhaps you're asking yourself, well, what does Ruckman make of the additions from the TR from which all English Bibles were translated? See, the King James was translated from this text. So if Ruckman holds to an uh, extreme King James onlyist position, how can he do so if he says that the text from which it was translated is corrupt? There's one question you need to ask yourself. Uh, obviously, he doesn't think that they're preserved, right? He would say that's a corruption. So what does he think about them? What does he think about them? And uh, if Ruckman doesn't believe that the preserved Word of God was kept pure for over a thousand years, how does he interpret scriptures that teach that God will keep His Word pure and preserve it? I mean, you, what do you do with, with scriptures like that? It's kind of like those uh, who want to rail against the doctrine of election, but guess what? The word election is in the Bible, so you have to believe in it. How you interpret it might be different, so the, the same goes here. God promised to preserve His Word. So what does Ruckman do when he comes across one of those promises to preserve His Word? How does he interpret that? Well, as for the question concerning the Greek text, uh, again, Ruckman believes that all manuscripts copied from the originals contained errors, and none of them were or are today the perfectly preserved Word of God. But now to understand how he deals with those passages that promise a preservation, uh, we need to understand what Ruckman taught about the translating of the Bible. So, Ruckmanism in translations. We looked at Ruckmanism in preservation, Ruckmanism in translations, and really they're, they're in a very similar category because uh, Ruckman fails to make a very needful distinction between preservation and translation, and we'll see that. Um, and again, let's recap. What have we learned thus far about about the translating of the Bible. Well, God has providentially preserved His Word in the originals, and we have access to that preserved Word, and God has providentially allowed faithful translations to be made from the preserved originals, from the preserved original. And um, these translations, these translations, it's accurate to say of a faithful translation that follows the text, it's accurate to say that it is the perfectly preserved Word of God because uh, they are perfect translations of the inspired, infallible text, right? So how can Ruckman have the perfectly preserved Word of God in English if there was no perfect text from which to translate it? I mean, that makes sense, does it not? I mean, God did not inspire the Bible in English. The Apostle Paul didn't speak English. So when he's writing his New Testament epistles, furthermore, the Old Testament prophets did not speak English. So when Isaiah is prophesying, he's not prophesying in English. So how did we get a perfect English Bible if we had no perfect text from which to translate it? Well, here's Ruckman's answer. He taught that God perfectly preserved His Word in the King James Version and the King James Version alone. Uh, a Ruckmanite and... Uh, you can talk to them, and they'll, they'll most readily admit this with a hearty amen. There is no other book that they can hold up in the whole world and say this is the Word of God besides a King James Version. So that's the only thing they can hold up, right, is the King James Version. Um, whereas I could, I could hold up Scrivener, and I could say without a doubt, this is the Word of God. This is the perfect Word of God. I could hold up a Spanish edition that was faithfully translated from this text, and I could say, this is the Word of God, so on and so forth, right? Uh, but a Ruckmanite could not do that. A Ruckmanite could not do that. And how does, how does God preserve His Word in the King James Version? Well, according to Ruckman, God did this by inspiring the translators the same way He inspired the original apostles that wrote the New Testament. He inspired the translators, so as they translated, they corrected the supposed errors in the Greek text. Emphasis on the quotation marks around that term, corrected. They corrected the, the Greek text. Now, let me read you some quotes from Dr. Ruckman. He says, in his book, Christian's Handbook of Biblical Scholarship, he says, the King James Bible was given by inspiration of God. And then he goes on to say this, if you can follow it in in his uh, book, Problem Texts, Problem Texts, he says this, Observe how accurately and beautifully the infallible English text straightens out Erasmus' 
Beza, Elzevir, and Stephanus, with the poise and grace of a swan as it smoothly and effectively breaks your arm with one flap of its wings. Beautiful, isn't it? If the mood or tense isn't right in any Greek text, the King James Bible will straighten it out in a hurry. In a hurry. Then he says this in the Christian's Handbook of Manuscript Evidence. He says the authorized version 1611 is superior to any Greek text. So what is Ruckman saying here? Ruckman is, is saying, well, because he doesn't believe that the Greek has been providentially preserved. Okay, the Greek is corrupt. Uh, there might be some good stuff in here, but it's corrupt, filled with errors. In 1611, really 1604, that's when production began on the King James Bible, God inspired those translators and gave them new revelation and gave them inspiration. And so when they came to uh, certain places in the Greek, they would realize that all of the Greek texts were corrupt and God would reveal to them the correct reading. That's according to Ruckman. It's according to Ruckman. And the linchpin of Ruckmanism is this false teaching of double inspiration. I'll write that on the board. Double inspiration. Double inspiration. And that is to say that the first inspiration was the original authors and the second inspiration were the translators of the King James Bible. Now let me say this emphatically. The men who translated the King James Bible were some of the most brilliant, gifted, and educated scholars that have ever lived. And so that's, that's one of the greatest compilation of scholars in the history of the world. But they were no more inspired than you or me. Educated linguists fluent in uh, dozens of languages. I think one fellow was fluent in over 20 languages. One, one fellow had read every single um, available writing in the Greek language in 1604. He'd read it all, but he wasn't providentially inspired. Okay? He, he was not free from error. He was fallible just like you and I when translating. Right? So, uh, double inspiration is the linchpin of Ruckmanism. And that is that the King James translators were inspired just like the apostles. And so, anytime the King James Version translates a word or phrase from the TR that captures the essence of the Greek, which couldn't be done if it was translated word for word, a Ruckmanite says that's an instance of the King James correcting the Greek. Right? See, I, I hold that there, there is no difference between this text and this text. This is a perfect translation of this text, right? That is, that is what we've, we've taught in this class. Now, Ruckman would say that that's not true. Ruckman would say that there's differences between the King James and your Textus Receptus, your Scribner's TR. How, how does he come to that position? Well, uh, it, it comes from a, a difference in the understanding of what we would call perfect, the, a perfect translation. A perfect translation does not necessarily mean literally word for word. It does not literally mean word for word. Uh, in some instances, you actually get a more accurate translation, a more precise translation, by changing the word. Because as you go from one language to the other, there's some phrases in languages that we don't have word for word in other languages. And there's some instances in the Bible where had the King James translators gone word for word, they would have actually diminished the essence of what the uh, biblical authors were trying to communicate. Trying to communicate. I'll give you an example of this. In Romans 6.2, and it's in, it's in a couple other places, you find this Greek phrase, me yenito, me yenito. Um, it looks like this. It's right here. Me yenito. And in um, in the Greek, that word me yenito means. Uh, God, or it means may it never be. May is like uh, uh, no, non, and genito, it's where we get our word like generate, means to be or to become. So we have may genito. Uh, and there are some English versions that just translate it, may it never be, or that could never happen. 
Uh, but the essence of that phrase in the Greek is much stronger than that. So the King James translators translated it, God forbid, which is the essence of what that phrase is saying. Therefore, it's a perfectly accurate translation. Well, a Ruckmanite would come to a, a me yenito, and they would say that that's actually a, a corruption of the text. That's actually an instance where the Greek had it wrong. And so they would say that when the King James Bible translators came to me yenito, they uh, corrected it as God forbid. But they would say that what the original authors wrote was actually... Um, God forbid, right? They would, they would disregard the me yenito, which the King James upholds. That's a little bit better transcription of that phrase there. Um, and so this would be a great example of when actually changing, changing the word, the exact word, carries the essence of the text much better than had you just done a literal word for word. It would have been a very wooden translation. Ruckman says in manuscript evidence on page 126, mistakes in the authorized version 1611 are advanced revelation, are advanced revelation. So when the King James says, God forbid, that's not just the King James translators using wisdom and saying, well, in English, a much more accurate a rendering of this phrase would be, God forbid, he would say, no, that's God giving them advanced revelation, whereupon they corrected the Greek. Very problematic, very problematic. And the Ruckmanite position argues that the King James Version is the only perfectly preserved copy of God's Word because of this advanced revelation. Therefore, the King James should be used to correct the Hebrew and the Greek. And we already saw that with Ruckman earlier. He says, it, man, it smooths out the problems in Beza and Stephanus and Scrivener and Elsevier, right? And um, all translations into other languages, Ruckman would say, should come from the King James Version, not the Greek. So if you're, if you're, going, if you're doing mission work and you're going to a, a location that doesn't have a Bible in their language, you don't need the Textus Receptus. You need to get a King James and translate from that. And even then, even then, you'll never have something that's equal to the King James. You know, if somebody really needs to, really, really wants to know what God said, they have to learn English. They have to learn the King James. Uh, that's, that's false. It's false. Providentially, God has made the word accessible to his people, right? And wherever his people is or are and whatever language they speak, in the providence of God, he sees to it that they get a faithful translation in their language. And Ruckman says, if any manuscript reading or translation differs from the King James in any way, then it's a corruption. Any slight, any slight reading, any slight difference, which is actually kind of ironic because if you know anything about the King James Bible, this is not the 1611 edition of the King James Bible. This is Blaney's 1769 revision of the King James Bible. King James Bible underwent a handful of revisions between 1611 and 1769. Uh, you can purchase a 1611 text, and let me say this, it's, it's not any different, really, than in substance than the 1769. There's a few spelling changes, a few articles are different, there's no substantive change, it's the same text, but there are differences. And so I, it's, it's interesting that Ruckman didn't argue for the 1611 edition. He, he was fine with saying that the 1769 was different. But yet I can show you places where if you're just looking for any minute difference, you know, uh, if you're looking for where Jesus is spelled with an I instead of with a J, well, according to this logic and this rubric, that's a difference. And therefore they can't be the same. So one's got to be a corruption. You see, but, but he doesn't follow that language. Uh, I've heard people argue that in Philippians 4.13, for instance, if you change strengtheneth, I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. If you change strengtheneth to strengthens, well, you've just corrupted the Bible. <laughs> you know, and those types of silly arguments, they don't do anything to defend the veracity of God's Word. They don't do anything to prove the providential preservation of God's Word, right? And it, it just, it's a fundamental misunderstanding, not only of, of preservation, but also of translation, also of translation. It's a simple principle that you can have two different words that both mean the same thing, and therefore both are accurate translations. You, know, you, can, have, you can have that. 
And so when we argue for the, the received text, that's why the additions uh, make very little difference. Um, and that's, that's why really when you come down to translating, you're capturing whatever's the most accurate translation of that original. And sometimes you can have two words. There's plenty of words in the English language where you have two words that mean the same thing. You know, and you get into debates over, well, is it Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost? Well, folks, if, if, there's a, if there's a change where you have in one where it says Holy Spirit and one where you have Holy Ghost, that's not a corruption of God's Word. You know, if you have one where it says everlasting life, one where it has eternal life, that's not a corruption of God's word. There's two words that are used synonymously, and the Bible authors use those words synonymously. That's what really uh, kills me about the debating this when it comes to the Bible is because the authors do it. You can read passages in the New Testament where they're quoting the Old Testament, but they don't quote it word for word. They quote it with a word that means the same thing. Look at Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost. Look at Peter's sermon in Acts 4 where he does that. Right? And you can also do this in translation. In fact, sometimes, again, using a different, uh, a different wording captures the meaning of the, of, the, uh, of the original. For instance, if we were translating from Spanish to English and we were translating the phrase, you know, me llamo es Adam, right? Well, you would not say, my calling is Adam. You really wouldn't even say, my name is Adam. Or you wouldn't really even say, I am called Adam. You would say, my name is Adam. Even though yamo, mi yamo, is not Spanish for my name is, right? But that, that would be the most accurate translation. Uh, the same is the case with figures of speech. The same is with figures of speech. For instance, uh, it, 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 we've had some really bad weather the last couple days. And if I said, man, it's raining cats and dogs, well, if we translate that into German, we're not going to say, regnet katzen und hunde. You know, that, they don't have that expression. You go over to Berlin, say, Regnet Katzen und Hunde, and that, you know, they won't know what you're talking about. But there is a German phrase for heavy rain, right? And the Bible does this. You know, it, in, in 1611, there were some English phrases that we don't have, we don't have today. Any of y'all ever heard a phrase for, uh, for like, mocking and, and reveling? You ever heard casting at their teeth? No, you probably not, unless you've read the Bible, because we don't use that today. But the, the, the King James translates a Greek phrase for revile and mock. When Jesus was on the cross, it says the two thieves that were hanging with him cast the same at his teeth. Now, that, is that a perfect translation of the original? Absolutely. But it's also a phrase that was used in the 1600s that's not used today. So if you're translating uh, that verse into another foreign language, you wouldn't mention teeth. Because there's no mention of teeth in the original language. It's accurate because it accurately conveys the meaning of the text. But a Ruckmanite would say that because the King James translators used that 1600 phrase, cast the same at his teeth, if you're going into Spanish, you've got to mention teeth in that verse or you're corrupting God's word. That's illogical. It makes no sense. It doesn't understand just the basic principles of translating. Well, obviously, there's a lot of examples, a lot of principles uh, that we could show you from the scriptures, but hopefully you get the point here, right? It's a fundamental misunderstanding of preservation. That is, it doesn't believe that God providentially preserved his word, but for a period of over a thousand years, you know, God's people did not have the full and complete word of God. And you ask someone who holds to a Ruckmanite position, where was the Bible before 1611? And some will say, well, I don't know. Some will say, well, it just wasn't there. It was only impartial, right? Very problematic answers, very problematic position. So that's Ruckmanism and preservation, Ruckmanism and translation. I want to talk just briefly about what we call the, the Ruckmanite light position or Ruckmanism light, this quasi-Ruckmanite position. Uh, and it's a position that would not claim to be Ruckmanite, and so we don't want to just, just cast it into the same camp. Don't want to do that. But... They accept a lot, uh, some more than others, of these presuppositions of Ruckmanism. For example, I've heard it argued that the Word of God was preserved in the extant Greek manuscript. So they don't say that the Greek was just totally corrupted. They say that it was preserved kind of here and there, but that God's people really didn't know where it was until 1611. You know, uh, which, again... It's the same question we would ask the modern textual critic. What good is it for God to preserve his word if his people don't have access to it for a thousand years or however long you believe 
uh, that was the case. And I, I've heard the idea, I've, I've heard it in, I've seen it in print, the idea that God waited until 1611 to fulfill the promise of preservation. You know, that, that uh, kind of like all the materials were there and you had the readings in Greek manuscripts all over the place, but the Word of God wasn't really preserved until 1611. And I've heard, a lot of it's just um, basic ignorance of history and how the King James Bible was translated. You know, um, the idea that the, that the King James translators laid out 5,000 extant manuscripts in front of them and they just went through all those manuscripts and, and picked the readings and, and threw them in the King James Bible. That's not true at all. They had a, a printed edition of the Greek New Testament in front of them. You know, by the time you get, by the time you get to 1611, you have editions of Beza, you have editions of Stephanus, you have editions of Erasmus. They had printed editions, single editions of the New Testament text. They were able to thoroughly examine these editions, something they couldn't have done had they been sitting there with 5,000 manuscripts in front of them. I, and I understand that a lot of those manuscripts were partial. None of them you know, necessarily contained all of the New Testament. But how many of you have read the New Testament 5,000 times? Right? How many of you have read a chapter of the New Testament 5,000 times? Right? I mean, if you've read one chapter of the New Testament 500 times, you've read that chapter a lot. So do you think that those 47 men that translated the King James Bible were sitting there in 1604 saying, okay, we got seven years, let's, <laughs> let's get through these 5,000 manuscripts? No. They had printed editions of the Greek New Testament text. And furthermore, they believed that the printed editions that they had were the Word of God. They were not sitting there debating what the Word of God is. They were not saying, well... We really don't know if Stephanus is accurate or if Beza is accurate. We really have no idea whether or not they're accurate or not. We're, we're just going to go through and rely on God to give us a, a feeling and inspire us and reveal to us what the, what the Word of God is. It might not even be in the text. That was, no, that wasn't their position at all. They believed that they had the Word of God, and their only concern was faithfully translating the Word of God into the English language. They weren't looking for the text, right? Um, this, this quasi-position uh, also manifests itself by using some of the same illogical and silly arguments that Ruckman used to support some of his positions. And there's far too many of these to name, uh, but I think as somebody who's very passionate about this subject, as somebody who's put a lot of time into this subject and really cares a lot about the preservation of the Scriptures, really cares a lot about what uh, what is going on in, in the world of bibliology and really loves the received text in the King James Bible, it really pains me uh, when I hear someone that thinks they're ardently defending the veracity of the preservation of God's Word that uses some of these silly and illogical arguments that just cannot stand against something like the modern critical text position. like Things like, uh, you know, all other English Bibles are just satanic perversions. Like the the... the Translators of the ESV, they're just a bunch of Satanists that want to corrupt the Word of God. That's foolish. It's, it's foolish. We have our scholarly disagreements with the critical text. We have our disagreements with the, with the, the mode of, of translation and the product of modern textual criticism. But to just say that all other English versions besides that came after the KJV are nothing but Satanic perversions and that all of the people that translated them were just lost heretics is foolish, but I've heard that said. I've heard that said. Um, to say that, you know, the, the, that verse over in Psalm 12, the word is purified seven times. Well, that refers to the English versions, and you had your, your Tyndale and your bishops and your Geneva, your Matthew, and that's seven times, and you get to the King James. Stop it. You know, that, that doesn't help defend the preservation of the word of God. Uh, things like you can't learn the doctrines of grace or you can't learn Baptist distinctives unless you have a King James Version. Well, let me tell you, there were Sovereign Grace Baptists before 1611. There were Sovereign Grace Baptists before Elizabethan English even came to be around. And, and they had the Word of God and they learned these truths. So explain that one to me. Riddle me this, Batman. You know, arguments that just misunderstand historical facts. 
you know, misunderstand historical facts that, that say, that, that say, you know, you had the, the majority text, the majority text is the TR, which that's not true, they're different texts, and you had this faithful line coming from Byzantine, and then you had these heretics in Antioch that were going through the Bible with scissors, cutting verses out, and things like that. You know, there's just arguments like this that, that ought not be used. The, the historical data is pretty much there for the most part, and uh, there's plenty of, of angles that you can go at this issue. There's plenty of things to uh, honestly question from the modern critical text position. But doing what Ruckman does and calling it the Alexandrine cult and anybody that, that uses a modern version is a satanic heathen, that doesn't help, that doesn't help. Uh, defend the truth of God's preserved word. Using circumstantial and uh, subjective arguments, well, all the revivals in America happened under the King James Version. You know, cool beans, that doesn't, that doesn't prove anything. Again, what did we teach in, in week number one of this class? Where is our authority for bibliology? It's the Bible itself. What the Bi I, don't, I don't care uh, what happened under what preaching. What I care about is... Um, is what does the Bible teach about itself? That's, that, that, is, that is our ultimate authority. It has to be our ultimate authority if we're going to be consistent. And if we're going to engage this conversation, you know, we, we often, what's, what's, what's so funny about this is those who hold to a more Ruckmanite position accuse the critical, or accuse the, the received text position, they accuse it of, of being soft or being limp-wristed or being liberal and compromising. But then the modern critical text position wants to do everything they can to throw those who don't hold into a Ruckmanite position but who prefer the received text in the King James Bible, they want to throw them in with the Ruckmanites. Just say, you're just a bunch of King James onlyists, right? Well, we don't really help them when we use faulty and illogical arguments. We don't help ourselves, right? So, uh, this perhaps wasn't as structured as, as some of our other weeks, but I think this is very important to cover. You know, what's ironic about Ruckmanism is that it, it claims to take a strong stand on the Bible, but in reality, it's a very weak and faithless position on the preservation of Scripture because Ruckmanism teaches that there was a period, according to Ruckman, from when Constantine died, early 400s to 1611, over a thousand years, where there was no perfectly preserved copy of God's Word on earth. That's extremely, extremely Problematic. As far as preservation goes, that's even worse than the modern textual critic position as far as preservation goes. And so both positions would deny providential preservation categorically and fundamentally, right? And um, we, we want to hold to a view of the text that is thoroughly, thoroughly biblical. Thoroughly, thoroughly biblical. And so that's why we spent the last two weeks dealing with modern textual criticism and the critical text, and this week dealing with Ruckmanism and some of its variations. And of course, we're just touching the surface on both of these subjects. I'd commend you to study it on your own, to look into it on your own. Um, so now we set ourselves up for uh, our next week, and that is this question. Well, um, if believing bibliology doesn't hold to a Ruckmanite King James only position, if, if, Textus, if a TR only position does not equal King James only, well, then how does providential preservation lead us to the retention of the King James Version? You know, we've dispelled modern textual criticism, and now we've dispelled the, the radical King James only position. So why the King James? Why the King James? And we will discuss that next week. So thank you so much for being in attention tonight, and we look forward to meeting together again next time. Thank you.